started because you all are here and it's so wonderful and thanks so much for um, coming out tonight. We have a very special program, but before I start, I always have to plug things happening <coughs> at the library. So everyone saw the book sale. There's still many treasures to be found and had. Go ahead, dig through. All um, sales are by donation, so we do appreciate you digging and having to have those special books. Um, that is going to be until March 27th, so get them while they're hot. Um, we have next week on Saturday, I guess it's this Saturday, 20, the 23rd. That's this Saturday. That's this Saturday. We have music in the library, so as you're digging through the books that you want to buy or picking up your bestseller, we are going to serenade you with beautiful music from Jeremy and Carolyn, and they are related to Sarah Goff, our wonderful um, volunteer who works the front desk. So her mom's a wonderful musician, and Jeremy's her husband, and we had them at Christmas time, and it was just, it was just great. I just loved it, and they kept saying, are you sure it's not too loud? I was like, no, just keep playing, it's wonderful. So come in next Saturday and have some good music while you pick your wonderful books. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Michael Schroeder, oh, Dr. Michael Schroeder. And he's going to talk to us about cryptanalysis in classical literature. I have no idea what that means. But you so pronounced it properly, I, which is critical. I've been practicing. Um, and I'm going to just introduce him, and he'll introduce you to this whole coding and deciphering in classical literature. Um, we talked about this, I think, last year. And it's taken me a year to really try and figure out what exactly you're talking about. Michael donated this book to the library, which is Codes and Villains and Mysteries. So, I mean, it's really um, speaks to exactly what he's going to talk about tonight. So if you want to practice and learn about more. Well, depends on um, what you're interested in. We have um, that. So Dr. Schroeder is the president of the Civil War Roundtable of New Hampshire. He got his B.S. degree at Illinois Institute of Technology, his M.S. from the University of Illinois, and his Ph.D. from the University of Maine, all in physics. Dr. Schroeder is also a veteran. He served on active duty in the Navy from 1979 to 1983 and during Desert Storm and Desert Shield. His hobbies, of course, are cryptanalysis, and he's been an active member of the American Cryptogram Association since 2001. Yeah. <laughs> wow. He's a native of Chicago, but now lives here right in Berwick. And he's currently employed by the shipyard. But not much longer. But not much longer. <laughs> he is a health physicist, <sighs> but soon to be a Berwick Library volunteer. Oh, my word. <laughs> what a step up, huh? So... From PhD in and a you know a health physicist to a to a library. Uh, okay, well thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Uh, uh, cryptanalysis, as, as I pointed out, is my hobby. Uh, I got interested in it kind of through a, through a back the back door. Uh, when I was young, I uh, I like most people had a uh, a crisis in my life where I had to decide what it was I was going to be uh, doing with the rest of my life. Okay. Uh, I had two interests as a kid, science and uh, in history. Uh, and history was winning out uh, until I went to high school. And I had a couple of really good t teachers, Father Delich in physics, uh, Father Fisher in chemistry. And I decided I would, uh, I would turn to the dark side and uh, become a mathematician of all things. Okay, oh my word, what a poor decision that would have been. Okay, but I, I, I did go off to uh, Illinois Institute of Technology and to become a, a mathematician, but uh, quickly learned that I was really interested in solving real-world problems and uh, gravitated into physics and couldn't stop, couldn't get enough of it. It's kind of like eating potato chips. You know, we can't eat just one, so I ended up uh, with, a, with a PhD. Uh, all along, I was still interested in history, but it, the two of those things do not match very well together, okay, until... Uh, 
Oh, it was a, it was uh, in uh, 2000, 2001, I think. I read uh, Simon Singh's The Code Breakers. It was a history text, but it was on code breaking, and I realized, oh my, you know, this is this has a lot of what I like about physics. It's got math, logic, that kind of thing in it. You got to, you know, so I uh, I had for years a a Dover paperback on on cryptograms, solving cryptograms. I read through that. Uh, and it was, it was all about this group called the American Cryptogram Association. But the book had been written in the 1930s, and I figured it probably had, had died in the, in, the, in the interim. But I, uh, I was trying to find more cryptograms to solve. Uh, went on the Internet, and by golly, there was the American Cryptogram Association. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member there. And th i got to say, this does overlap those two interests very nicely. This uh, not only does it have a, a mathematical piece to it, cryptanalysis. But you, whenever you're solving a, a new cipher, you get to learn something about the history, about who used it, how they used it, and that sort of thing. Uh, I have absolutely no interest in literature, okay, but I thought I would. <laughs> All right. So why, why, why a, a, a literature uh, thing on, on, on literature? Well, the ACA, like most groups, is constantly looking for new members, okay? Uh, I don't know but what your experience is, but with both the ACA and, the, and our uh, Civil War Roundtable, uh, attendance and, and membership is dwindling. Okay. Um, the hope is, is you, you can maybe grab up a few kids at an early age, get them interested in solving codes and ciphers, okay? And uh, maybe they won't remember it immediately, but eventually they'll become, you know, somebody like me, and they'll come back to it sometime. Uh, Presently, cryptanalysis uh, and codes and ciphers are, is being primarily used by teachers of mathematics and uh, the sciences, STEM disciplines, try to interest kids in, um, in, in STEM topics. Uh, the Ma Mathematical Association of, the, of, the U of America has an annual uh, mathematics contest, and there's a small piece of it that's uh, based on uh, codes and ciphers. Uh, uh, Brit Britain has an uh, annual cipher contest each year, uh, and it seemed to me that it would be, you know, it would be nice if we could do something like that, but when you, when, you, when you concentrate on those people, there's a good half of the population you're ignoring. The thought was, is maybe if we study, we uh, combine this two, cryptanalysis and the study of literature, you know, you might get a different group of people interested, uh, and possibly you could either get them interested in, uh, again, get them interested in, in cryptanalysis, uh, or even get them maybe interested in STEM or get STEM people interested in literature. Okay, so in both ways. This lecture is kind of a bare bones thing. Uh, it's only going to talk about five of the, of the more um, commonly cited uh, stories that involve cryptanalysis. Okay, now you might say, what is cryptanalysis? Or even better yet, crypto what? Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that the librarian did manage to pronounce it correctly. Uh, I've gotten a lot of uh, crypto. As you say, I'm looking for books on cryptanalysis. Going to an old bookstore, and they say, "You look. Are you interested in graves?" You know, no, but, yeah, no. But uh, anyway, uh, cryptanalysis is kind of a hodgepodge. I mean, uh, it's 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 had a um, a number of uh, of names and 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 or a number of little studies of fields that are it, it overlaps steganography study of secret writing invisible inks microfilm i'm sure everybody possibly most of you at one point in time in your youth maybe did made some uh invisible ink out of a lemon juice or something like that uh, cryptology on the other hand is the overall study of secure communication systems how can we you know how do they work whereas cryptography uh, yet another you know term is the design of these secure systems these are people who are trying to make codes that are, un you know, are difficult to, to uh, uh, break or, or, or uh, whatever. Anyway, and cryptanalysis at last, which is a terrible word. It just does not come off your, your tongue very well. The study of methods of analyzing and solving uh, cryptographic systems with no a priori knowledge of, of what the, the guy, the person intended. So cryptographers are code makers. And cryptanalysts are code breakers. And we're going to talk primarily about cryptanalysis, people who are out trying to break codes, messages they weren't intended to read. Now, you need a little, I'll just have a little bit of understanding of what some of the cryptographic systems are. You've all heard of codes. 
Codes officially are things like com where complete words, phrases, or sentences are replaced by some kind of ciphertext, usually called a code group. Uh, sometimes words, more commonly, uh, five-digit numbers, things like that. Okay, uh, common words normally have more than one code group associated with them. And codes, because uh, they have a limited number of terms and words, they usually have to have some way of spelling out words that aren't in their, in their lexicon. Two types. There is a, what's called a one-part code, and I'll, I'll pass this around so you can see what a, a World War II era uh, code book looks like. Uh, both the plain text and their associated code groups are in the same alphabetic order. So if you want to look, you can use the same book, both to encode by looking over here, figure out what the word is, and then going over and getting the, the code group. Or when you're decoding, you can go and get an alphabetical order, find the, the code group, and then go over and get the plain text word. So here's, a, here's an example of a, of a uh, from some, somebody, I don't know, I got it for like about $5 on eBay. I think I paid more for shipping, but it was nice to have one. Two-part code, on the other hand, uh, the uh, code groups are not in alphabetical order. They're mixed up with respect to the code words. So the advantage of that is, is it's a lot harder to break. The disadvantage is you end up having to have two books. Okay, one, each one with, uh, with a, uh, an alphabetical uh, uh, setup. Ciphers, on the other hand, are what we're really more interested in here. In these cases, individual letters, or at most a group of a couple letters in, uh, of the plain text are modified either by transposition or some other algorithmic system to form ciphertext. Three classic types. Concealment ciphers. Okay, that's where you are going, you, you have a message you want to send out. You don't really want anybody to know you're trying to communicate at all, so you'll hide the message inside of much larger piece of text. Okay, this is commonly used by uh, prisoners and spies, people who aren't supposed to be communicating at all. Okay, classic example, World War I German spies taking ads out in the New York Times that were essentially messages they were trying to get to, pe to, get to people. Okay, use a newspaper art, um, advertisement as a way of communicating with people. Modern example, we'll see in a bit, a word sleuth puzzle. There are, <laughs> boy, some people just never make it on time. Transposition ciphers, um, uh, true letters of the secret message, are, 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 are not modified in any way, but we mix the letters up in some uh, rever easily reversible way, and you get uh, an, uh, an, a rearranged pattern based on a, usually on a, based on a key. And a modern example is the jumbles puzzle. Everybody here played the tried the jumbles at once. I'm terrible with that. I got good for a while, and then I stopped doing it. And now I go back. And I, oh gosh, you know. Uh, and the last but not least, tr substitution. True letters of a secret message are replaced by substitutes. The letter order is not changed. Modern examples uh, you see in the newspaper are like the crypto quip or the crypto quote. Here's some quick examples here. Uh, a concealment cipher. Cipher. You got a word. You got a thing that says like the great old pumpers. Doesn't look like anything. It looks kind of you know kind of odd wording, but you know, and there he's, it doesn't mean any much except that if you take a look at the center letter of each of these words, H E L P, the message is help. Okay, again, concealment, uh, not the most common form of cipher. Uh, transposition, okay, here we're going to reverse each uh, uh, sequential two letters. So this is M E E T, that's meet me at F I V E, meet me at five. Okay, so you've, you've scrambled the letters up. And last but not least, substitution, using the classical Caesar shift. Uh, where uh, capital C, the ciphertext C is A, ciphertext D is lo uh, plain text B, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you get this thing, you get this nonsense right here. And if you uh, translate it, it becomes Vini, Vini Viki, which of course is uh, classical Caesar. Well, a little bit of Latin that I remember. Okay. And here, right on a one page out of a newspaper, are all three cipher types. Here's your word sleuth. You see the word is hidden in the in the here. Okay. Uh, jumbles. Uh, I've been I, I've been staring at this all week as I go through this thing and I can't get any of these. Uh, yeah. Uh, then of course the crypto quip. And the, with, with this is a simple substitution with word uh, su uh, word uh, uh, spacing.
word separations. What's the most common character in uh, English uh, language, written language? Mm -hmm. uh, you'd be right about letter. I, the most common thing is the space, the blank space. And when you give up something like that here, it becomes a lot easier. Get rid of those spaces, this becomes a hard thing to do. Trust me. Okay. Um, well, anyway, just a little tidbit there. So let's quickly go through a lexicon of terms. You'll hear me spouting off, no doubt. Blah, 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 you know, uh, plain text is, uh, is the original text of a message. It's written in plain English, so we call it plain text. Usually displayed using lowercase letters. Cipher text is the text of the message you're sending out, uh, and it's usually displayed in uppercase letters. A cipher system is any method of producing cipher text from plain text, normally by the use of a key or a keyword. Okay, these things are usually generalized and such that you, you give it a key or keyword, number or a, or a let word, and that tells you how to use the, this particular system to produce the cipher text. And that's this key or keyword there. It's just the way of you setting up the cipher system. It's similar to the combination of a lock. Okay. And you got end ciphering. Okay. Applying a cipher system to plain text to produce cipher text. Okay. This is what a cipher clerk does. Deciphering. Applying the cipher system to cipher text to get the plain text back. Again, something a cipher clerk would do. Decrypting is analyzing and solving ciphertext with no a priori knowledge of the cipher system. That's what cryptanalysts do. And then there's en encrypt encryption, which is, there's no such thing. This would imply that you were, you were, uh, you were with no, um, no knowledge of the, of the cipher system creating ciphertext. Okay, but this word you'll see around all over the place. Uh, but these are the only three. Decry encryption is a word that you'll see used, and you, some people think it means the same as enciphering. In other words, taking the plain text and making a cipher out of it. No, that's enciphering. Encryption implies you do not, the crypt part of this, implies you don't know anything about the cipher system. And you're doing something based on, you know, based on analysis. Decrypting is deciphering without any knowledge, initial knowledge of the, uh, of the cipher system. And we'll start with this. Gold bug, 1843. How many of you have read this? Okay, yeah, I, I, I was forced to read it in, I think, sixth grade. I wasn't forced. Yeah, I was. But, you know, I, I actually can not like it. Uh, it was, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. I remember, the, the best thing I remember about this is for weeks afterwards, people were writing one another secret messages. Okay. It's a hundred and, it looks, I, I couldn't believe this. It's a 175-year-old story. Wow, okay. Um, uh, by Edgar, obviously, Allan Poe. And here's a piece of, uh, here's, I think, from one of the original uh, uh, publications. Here's a, uh, uh, this is the man serving Jupiter. He's up in a tree. He's lowering the, uh, the plumb bob. They're going to uh, end up digging up a, a treasure here from this tree. Okay. Uh, and here's Edgar Allan Poe. Good looking guy, right? Oh. Okay, um, born in 1809, he's a local boy, Boston, Mass. Okay, orphaned at age two, taken in by the Allens, uh, hence the middle name. In 1827, he enlists in the Army under an assumed name. Publishes his first works, and eventually he gets himself up, set up to attend West Point, but he gets himself expelled, you know, deliberately gets himself expelled when he realizes he doesn't like the place. He had no choice. He probably couldn't have gone to the Naval Academy, except it wasn't going to exist for 15 years. Okay. And just to show you how different the 19th century was than our present time, 1835, he marries his 13-year-old cousin. He's 26 years old. Something odd here. Okay. Uh, I don't know. But it was a different time. 1841, he publishes a few words on secret writing. He was the publisher of the Southern Home uh, Literary Review or something. Uh, it was a relatively popular uh, literary magazine at the time. And to get the, the uh, circulation even higher, he, uh, he started writing about secret writing, secret codes and stuff. And he challenged people to send in codes and ciphers and see if he, anybody could, uh, could stump him. And he, he got most of them, okay? Uh, and along the way, he, we obviously wrote some other stories, one of which is the is the thing we were talking about, the gold bug. January 1845, he publishes The Raven. 
1847, his wife ends up dying of consumption, and two years later, he dies under mysterious circumstances in Baltimore. Yeah, he's quite, the, quite a guy. Quite the life, okay? Um, in any case, plot synopsis. This is important stuff. William Legrand and his manservant Jupiter, they live in a small cabin on Sullivan's Island near Charleston, South Carolina. What do you know about Sullivan's Island? Civil War, yeah. It's, it, there, there's, uh, this is where Fort Moultrie is. There's fighting all around this island uh, during the Civil War. Okay. One day, uh, the, the, uh, Will, Mr. Lagrange and his manservant are out uh, walking along the beach, and they capture a previously unknown gold-colored beetle, the gold bug of this thing, okay? And with the aid of a piece of scrap parchment they just happen to find laying in the sand. They're looking around. They don't want to get bit. They see this piece of, of, of parchment extruding from the uh, sand. He goes over and he gets it out. It's in the sand near an old shipwreck. Okay. That night, while Lagrange is describing the beetle to a uh, unnamed uh, narrator, uh, the, he, he, the narrator is, is looking at the, this drawing that he has on a piece of paper. The, you know, the big hound that the uh, Lagrange has gets up and you know starts play, wants to play with the guy. He almost touches the fireplace with the, with the paper, and the heat activates what apparently is secret writing. But only Lagrange no, no, notices it, okay? And he doesn't tell anyone. And for about the next two weeks, he starts acting quite strangely. Uh, the manservant gets very worried, but uh, about two weeks later, on one night, Lagrange takes Jupiter and the narrator on a long nighttime journey. The narrator is saying all along, look, when we get back home, if you don't find anything, we're going to put you in a nice little, you know, warm place and keep you, you know. Anyway, you know, he's assuming the guy's nuts. Many odd actions by Grand lead, lead him to almost certainly believe he's got, but in the end, however, they uncover this pirate treasure, okay, worth millions. He, they, they spend like a, half, a couple of paragraphs just describing all the types of gold and silver and all the jewels and everything. It's, it's quite uh, interesting. When later asked how he knew of the treasure, Legrand describes the message on the parchment uh, uh, and how he decrypted it. And there's the message. What do you think? What do you think? Could this be a transposition cipher? No, why, no, why not? There's no letters. Well, you could transpose this all around. Maybe nowadays with GPS, maybe you could transpose this into some you know, Latin long or something. But back then, you know, the, the GPS was a, was a sextant and the sun. So, you know, you're, you're not going to do it that way. Okay. Um, it's, it can't be a concealment cipher, right? So this has got to be some sort of substitution cipher. Okay. Uh, why do you think he, the, the uh, captain is, by the way, is, this is Captain Kidd's, because uh, there's, like, there's a goat on, on the thing too. You know, a little goat, a kid. Okay. Uh, so it's Captain Kidd's. Uh, why did he use these symbols? Because Edgar Allan Poe knew it had to be typeset, and he knew what they had in their typeset uh, things. So he couldn't use letters, so he took everything the guy had that were, wasn't letters. So some of these symbols are, are a bit odd, double crosses, and some of them we know, you know, punctuation things and stuff like that. Uh, well, anyway, there you go. That's the message. How would you go about solving this? What would you do? Questions. Brief intermission. Questions. Given what it was comp that was composed by a pirate, what kind of cipher is this likely to be? And the, the young lady has de correctly identified it as probably being a substitution cipher. In what language might it be written? That's always a question you got to ask with cryptograms. It could be, yeah, uh, you're right. Anybody who's a pirate, I mean, it's probably their native language. But let's face it, there's pirates that are Spanish, English, French, Portuguese, you name it. Captain Kidd, luckily, he's English, okay? So it's probably going to be English. The message provides the location of treasure. What kind of probable words might you think would be in there? What, what, what's he going to be describing? What kind of, what's he going to be talking about? Oh, uh, terrain. Terrain. Where, where is this thing? You know, it's got things like, uh, you know, maybe like tree might be, or a rock to explain what this thing is. Uh, you know, distances. So there might be some numbers written out. Okay, things like degree, uh, and how would you go about analyzing it? Throw up your hands, say, too hard for me? Where's Schroeder? I mean, where? 
Yeah, of course, everybody says, oh, sure. No, you can do this. This is not hard. This is, this is the simplest stuff out there, okay? He, Lagrange does a... Make us feel worse. Huh? Make us feel even worse. Oh, come on, you can do this. I could, I could teach you to do this in 10 minutes. Okay, Lagrange, Lagrange performs a frequency analysis. He goes and he finds out how many, how many different characters there are and how many of them there are. And he looks, the, high, the highest frequency one is 8 with 33. The semicolon 26, and then the rest of them are almost a factor of two less than the top one. Now, somebody mentioned, what's the most common letter in the English language? The space. Well, it's other than this letter, letter, <laughs> not character. But you're, you're, see, I got them already. They're, 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 what? E. It's about 13% of ordinary text. The second most common one is? T. T at 9%. Okay, so if you were going to guess, you'd say uh, that 8 is probably an E. T, maybe. The other one would be A. Okay, uh, the most common letters are what we call the senior, senorita letters. S-E-N-O-R-I-T-N-A. Senorita, it's a good way to memorize it. Okay, uh, so the rest, of we, we might have one. We certainly probably have one, maybe two. Okay, E turns out to be the most common letter in just about every language. I think the one uh, exception might be Latin. Okay. So, based on its frequency, Legrand says, I bet you this 8 is an E. And he goes through and he puts all the E's in. And he says, well, look, he finds seven reoccurrences of the sequence. Semicolon, 4, 8. So there's some three-letter sequence where E is at the end. Now, could this be the most common word in the English language? The word that makes up 7% of all the written word? What do you think? Yeah, and that word would be the. Okay, one interesting thing to know, on all languages, when you find the most common word, okay, the top word, in this case, the 7%, the second most common word will be one half as frequent as the first common word. The third word, one third is common. The fourth, one fourth is common as the, as the one over N. And it goes on for a, in English for 10,000 words. The 10,000th word is one ten thousandth as frequent as the uh, first word, or the most frequent word. It's called Ziff's Law. So, uh, and, but anyway, the is a good chance. He says, hey, you know, I bet you that's the word the. And the, Legrand, Legrand continues his analysis, and he finds things, and once he's got the E's and the T, he finds the word tree, you know, the kind of thing people, you know, okay, through, degree, and, a few, and after a few rounds, he, gets mo he recovers most of the text. As Legrand notes to the narrator, I have said enough to convince you that ciphers of this nature are readily soluble and to give you some insight into the rationale of their development. But be assured that the specimen before us apperta appertains to the, most, the very simplest species of cryptograph. Notice, another word we don't use today, the, the, the terminology of crypt cryptanalysis and, and cryptography has changed over the years, and uh, it wasn't didn't really st it didn't really become uh, solidified until after World War One. So, anyway, and there's our final decrypt: a good glass in the bishop's hostel, in the devil's seat, 41 degrees and 13 minutes northeast, and by north, main those distances, uh, directions north, main branch, seventh limb, east side, shoot from the left eye of the death's head, a beeline from the tree. Through the shot 50 feet out. Okay, uh, if you take a look here, we'll go back to this thing real quick. Um, see, there is D E G R E E. You can almost start sight reading it. Right? You would have, right? You've, oh, of course. Yeah, well, but there you go. That's, we've turned all of this into plain text. Okay, just by us knowing a little bit about English language, okay, uh, uh, and uh, doing the, be the best he could. The cipher is a variation on what the ACA would call an ornamental patristocrat. That's a ordinary cipher, but without the word divisions. Without the word word divisions, it's an order of magnitude harder than the crypto quip in the in the in the newspaper. Believe me, I know. <sighs> okay. Advantages of using this story. It's a moderate length story. It takes less than an hour to read. 
And, they, and it is in this good book. So notice what's on, notice what's on front. The, uh, yeah. I got my own copy. Uh, uh, how many have this been taken out continuously since I, I you got it, right? Uh, I, I you probably had to call it in to make sure it was here. <laughs> I hit it. Oh, you hit it. <laughs> All right. It's an exciting topic. What story isn't better with pirates in it? You know, it's got pirates. Ooh, treasure. Okay. A big dog. An excellent introduction to the solution of aristocrats and personal aristocrats. You read it, he goes through and in great detail explains how he, how he deciphered that thing. And you read it and you say, this is, this is, you can use this as a tutorial today. Uh, and, and, uh, disadvantage? Politically incorrect depiction of a minority. No. Jupiter is a freed, freed uh, slave. Okay. And he, you know, he talks in dialect. Uh, but in all in all, it's a good story. I mean, it is 175 years old, okay? Well, and evaluation, a gripping good yarn. And cryptoanalytically realistic. Cryptoanalytically, think about that word. Blah, 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 blah. Imagine how amazing I can get that out. Okay, we'll try another. And here, just to show you that this story had legs and it effects, this is uh, a, a, one of Rose Greenhouse cipher messages from the Civil War. Notice. A bunch of gibberish symbols. Everybody thought you had to write in these mysterious symbols to make it a good cryptogram. Nonsense. All that did was made it, it, made it, it didn't make it hard at all. I decrypted this thing in about a half hour, but it was, it was, yeah, it was annoying. I had to go through this, I had to blow this up, and I had to go, okay, here's my first symbol, I'll assign that an A, and then I had to go find it everywhere and write A, A, A. Oh! Uh, B, 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 B. Ah, uh, yeah, but uh, it, you can, I decrypted this. It plus, she, she, her hand, the hardest thing was reading her own handwriting. She's, she had miserable handwriting. Uh, but she's got her own little, uh, she combined plain text and cipher text, which is never a good idea. But uh, you can see that, you know, even up to the Civil War, people were still thinking along these kind of gold bug lines. Okay. Journey to the Center of the Earth. Anybody seen that movie? How about the book? Anybody read it? Yeah, did you read it? Saw it. Saw it, right? The best thing about that movie is Pat Boone is almost eaten by a dimetrodon. <laughs> okay. That's the best thing about that movie. And it turns out the book and the movie are pretty close in most parts. Okay. Uh, I, I, I listened to it from LibriVox. I'm not going to... Uh, Jules Verne's a little... Mm. Uh, well, we'll see here. And there's, there's, there's a picture from it, the a subterranean ocean. Notice, I, the, funny thing I, the thing I find funny about this is the critters in here, these all look like the Crystal Palace models that were in London in, in, uh, in the 1840s. So I think he, uh, whoever did this uh, sketch must have gone out to uh, the Crystal Palace uh, Park, and they're still out there, by the way. And uh, that's a, I believe that's supposed to be a mesosaur, or is this the Dimetrodon? I don't even remember. This is but this is the Metrodon. They they not the Metrodon, the Iguanodon. They completely screwed it up. Plesiosaur, flying blizzards, great stuff. Yeah, you think, oh boy, a kid would really love this book, right? There he is, Jules Verne. Uh, born 1828, Nandes, France. Uh, at age 11, he tried to uh, he tried to uh, have his own little adventure by getting becoming a, a, a cabin boy on a cruise ship or a ship. His father caught him and brought him back. Who's then got him on the road to a ordinary life, okay? 1848-49, uh, he studies law in Paris. I mean, can you think about it? Here's a kid who wanted to go to sea, and now he's becoming a lawyer. Uh, okay, uh, publishes a play with Alexander Dumas II, not the, not the, not the important one, the, the son. 1851, he publishes his first novel, First Ships of the Mexican Navy, which is, I gotta believe, a ripping good yarn. I mean, I, what? You know, I mean, okay. Uh, Mexican Navy ships. Yeah, okay. Uh, first thing I would have thought of. Uh, May 1556, marries his, uh, his lifelong uh, honorine, as he'll have before his life, begins work as a stockbroker. He's come up one step from a lot, you know, it must have been like a hoot in the, you know. 1563, he finally publishes Five Weeks in a Balloon. That's the first of these extraordinary voyages, uh, things. He'll write them for the rest of his life. They're all the same, most of them, okay? People start out on some journey, 
they get some good luck, and then things go south, they go south, they go south, they go south, they go south, until the very end, and then whoosh, everything's saved. Uh, uh, some of them are better than others. I gotta admit, I really like Round the World in 80 Days. Uh, there's a scene in uh, 20,000 Leagues Beneath the Sea where the three main characters are looking out of this, this big window, which every submarine has, of course, right? And, you know, watching the fish go by. And they're naming it, one guy would name they give it the, its Latin name, the other uh, second guy would give it the, uh, the uh, common name, and the third guy would comment about whether you could eat it or not. And this went on for pages. Okay. Ah, a little butt. Okay. Uh, but he does, he writes a lot of these books, and he, up to 54 of them. And there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Dies uh, 25 March 1905 in France. Okay. And let's take a look at the, the, uh, the story. Come on. Oh, here we go. Story begins with the purchase by Professor Otto Lindenbrook, played by James Mason, okay, of a copy of the 12th century runic manuscript. And this um, about Icelandic kings. Lindenbrook's a professor of mineralogy, and that is his is, uh, assistant, nep slash nephew, Axel, played by uh, Pat Boone, okay, uh, is a little concerned because he doesn't know, you know, the mineralogy and runes don't go together. Uh, but Lindenbrook is, is, is happy. While examining the book, he determines it was once owned by Arnie Sacknusism. Sacknusism. But that was another name out of that thing, and I forget who that guy who played that guy. Arnie Sacknusen. Uh, Sacknusen, okay. Uh, he was uh, a guy who never slept. Really? He's he a real person? Little snatches of death. So he was a real person. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 Jules Verne did a lot of that, putting real people into his into his novels. Okay. Uh, famous. Okay. Further, he finds a slip of parchment in the book, also written in ruins. Curiosity leads the Linden book to attempt to translate the note, and there it is. What do you think? It looks like it's from Tolkien. No. Yes, it looks like it's from Tolkien. But notice. These are all pretty much one, two, two, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's like seven or cross in each of these things. Same number down. Is this like the gold bug cipher? Because it's got all the odd symbols? Not really, because this these are letters in a different in a different system. Okay. Like for instance, this this character right here. There it is. Uh, I lost it already. Anyway, this character right here, that's a double M. Now, notice that there's punctuation marks in there. What kind, if you were really stupid, what kind of cipher might this be? It might be a transposition cipher. And the guy is transpositioning the, the punctuation marks with this thing. Really good good work, guy. Uh, why don't you just give it away? Write it in plain text, okay? Uh, yeah, this is so. So, uh, utilizing his extensive knowledge of Icelandic ruins, because there must have been a course in the mineralogy, you know, for his mineralogy PhD, he substitutes the Roman alphabet equivalent, and he gets this stuff. Okay, what do you think? Again, notice the, the punctuation in there. Anything in there say it's not a transposition cipher? Transposition cipher ought to be pretty much, if it was English, which this may or may not be, okay, it should have the same distribution of letters that ordinary, the ordinary language would have. And there seem to be a number, number of E's. Uh, all of the, um, pretty much all of the uh, uh, vowels seem to be there. Uh, some of this might have been the beginning of a sentence uh, with a Y. Okay, so Professor... Uh, the professor recognizes the message is most likely a cryptogram and vows that neither he nor Axel will eat until it's been decrypted. Axel is distressed because he's a teenager. He wants to eat. Question, given it was composed by a 16th century alchemist, what kind of cipher would it be? Well, it might be a transposition cipher. We have, does decrypting a 200-year-old cipher pose any special difficulties? Well, you bet. Uh, the ruins. Okay. Uh, how would you go about analyzing it? What language might it be in?
I mean, he's Icelandic, so it might be Icelandic. What's the uh, language of, uh, of uh, scholars in the 16th century? It might be Latin. Okay. It's hard to know. So you should go about it. Okay. So what Professor assumes it, 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 that an alchemist would use a transposition cipher. Apparently, it's part of the contract you sign when you become an alchemist. You will use only transposition ciphers. Since Axel is unfamiliar with what that is, Professor Lindenbrook goes to, spends a few pages telling him, and he does a pretty good job of it. At first try at decryption, the professor says, let's rearrange the cipher first letters from each group first, because there's all this, then we'll go and put the second letters and the th of each second, and dot, 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 dot. Okay, so he goes, and he gets this nonsense, and he looks at it, and he says, it looks like mush. Okay? And he's, he's not happy. Can, but the solution is there. Can anybody see it? This is problem with route transposition ciphers. I hate these things. Okay? I'll t uh, we'll see in a minute. Okay, the professor and Axel do not see the solution. Professor Lindenbook, disappointed by the failure of his first decryption attempt, Leaves the house in a rage for a long walk, which does not make Axel happy because Axel still can't eat. Okay. Axel, driven by hunger, continues to work on the cipher. Eventually, he sees several Latin words pop out of the professor's initial decryption attempt. He reads the message and is dismayed at its contents. He vows to not let the professor have the key to the message, which, how long do you think that's going to last with somebody who's starving? Yeah, yeah about five minutes. Professor returns, continues his decryption attempts with no success. Eventually, hunger gets the better of Axel. It takes about 15 minutes. Okay, and he, he gives the professor the key. And as feared, the professor's reaction is, we start at once. So let's go back here. This is written in backwards. In Sneffels, Yako, Douglas, Kretera. Emer, uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So it's written backwards. You have to read back through it backwards. Okay? I actually realized the message was written backwards. The message can be read from the professor's original attempt, bottom line to top line, right to left. He pro this provides, in Sneffels, Yaculus, Craterum, Chem, Dilabat, Umbra, blah, 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 blah. What language is that? Come on. It's Latin, guys. Didn't anybody take Latin? It's just... Yeah. Oh, gosh. Anyway, Ar and then he signs it like an idiot. Why don't, why don't you just, you know, why don't you give it away, Arnie? Anyway, the cipher is a variation of what the ACA would call a route transposition cipher. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'm working on one of these now, and I'm not doing too well. Um, I hate these things. I hate transposition ciphers. I invented one. Anyway, and then if you put in plain English, Descend into the crater of Yakul of Sneffels, which the shade of Scataris caresses before the calends of July. Audacious traveler, and you will reach the center of the earth. I did, Arnie Saknusson, or whatever. So he, this is big, good stuff. Oh, let's think about it. Okay, let's do a pre, a pre post pre. Vantage. Cryptanalysis appears at the beginning. It's a novel. It's a novel-length story. Uh, as that is of interest. So what is of interest appears up front. It's an exciting topic. There's adventure. There's there's dinosaurs. There's all sorts of great stuff. Okay. A fine introduction solution of simple transposition ciphers. The disadvantages? Reading the entire novel provides a little cryptanalytic balance. So I don't know whether anybody would want to read the whole thing. Uh, did anybody read this at all? Anybody ever get assigned this book? No. Okay. I'm not surprised. Evaluation. A good read and cryptanalytically reasonable. He, he, he does a good job of it. Okay. It, it, that gives us our third story. The Adventure, adventure, blah, 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 blah. The adventure of the Dancing Men. Arthur Conan Doyle. It's a, a Sherlock Holmes story. Anybody read this? Okay. Some of you have. I read this when I was a kid. I had an English teacher. Uh, I think it was my sophomore year. He's really into Sherlock Holmes. He had us read The Hound of the Baskervilles, and that hooked me. Okay, so I, I've read all, almost all of this stuff. Uh, this is one of the more, there's a couple more that do have the ciphers, but this is one of the, one of the um, beloved ones, let's say. And there it is. Uh, five, white, five, let's see, five white guys picking on two, two women, okay. Uh, they're obviously servants. Uh, terrible, terrible. 
Holmes questions the servants. Okay. Uh, and there he is, Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, born 1859. He uh, trained as a, a medically medical student, 1876-1881 at Edinburgh. Uh, spent a few years as a ship's surgeon. Anybody know what the difference? I'm I'm, I'm a little confused. What's the difference between a surgeon and a doctor back then? Yeah. Uh, a doctor was a physician, and a surgeon was an advanced barber. Ah. Oh. So he was like pulling teeth and cutting hair too? That's right. Oh, that's good. I'd get a little, you know, some and money on the side. Removing things. Okay, yeah, that's kind of what I feel. I just, I, so there was a real, adep, there was a, a deaf. Is that when he was called the sawbones? Okay, well, he had probably what he was. He was a ship's sawbones. He was going to saw on people's bones. Anyway, 1885, he completes his MD degree. 1886, he writes a study in Scarlet, which is the first Holmes book. He'll go on to write uh, 56 short stories and four novels. Uh, following the death of his first wife in 1906, he finds solace in spiritualism. This guy is supposed to be, you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes. We all think of you know pure logic, you know, and you know, you know, unflappable. This guy fell into the every trap. He thought he saw fairies. Uh, he he, uh, he uh, uh, Houdini tried to get him to say, hey, uh, you know, show him the error of his ways. He said, if I can, you you bring me to one of these guys. Uh, one of these spiritualists, and if the next day I can reproduce every one of these things, okay, will you believe that these are fake? And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy would go, he'd you'd see this stuff, the next day Houdini would reproduce all the tricks, and he'd say, well, I, no, you can't be. You just can't be. So he was, you know, he was pretty credulous. Uh, dies in 1930. But, uh, uh, you know, some pretty good stories. Plot synopsis. Mr. Hilton Cubitt, Cubitt of Riddling Throp Manor in Derbyshire visits Sherlock Holmes and Jack. Think of the names of those towns. Why do we get stuck with Berwick and York County? Why couldn't this be Riddling Throp and we could be in Derbyshire County or something? Derbyshire. Shire means county, right? Visits Dr. Sherlock Holmes, Watson, it's for aid in solving mystery. His wife, Elsie, is an American. Before their wedding, she had uh, asked him to uh, promise to never ask about her past because she had some very disagreeable associations. She didn't do anything wrong, okay, that anybody can prove, okay, uh, in her life, although she herself had done nothing ashamed of. He, so he agrees to the request. He's, you know, uh, trouble begins when Elsie gets a letter from the U.S. Uh, she is obviously disturbed by it. She burns it. A couple of weeks later, messages start showing up on the house and around the house at, at, in the morning. And there are these little dancing men. Shh, okay. Cubit provides Holmes with this copy, okay. He uh, says, here it is, you know. Here's what I'm getting. Uh, Holmes agrees to take the case and tells Cubit he wants every occurrence of the dancing men. He wants to know everything he can. A few days later, Cubit provides uh, Holmes with a copy of this single message. Shh, as well as a second message with an apparent response from Elsie. Here's the second message. Here's Elsie's answer. Holmes exerts a great deal of effort analyzing the messages, but he doesn't inform Watson about anything. He always keeps Watson in the dark. Okay. The final message is received from Cubit a few days later. It's this longer message. Upon examining it, Holmes announces to Watson they must immediately proceed to Derbyshire. Okay, without delay. But it's too late in the evening. There's no trains the next morning. Apparently, Watson and, and, and Holmes are uh, ignorant of the existence of telephones and telegraphs. So they just go back to their, their house. They leave the next morning. They arrive at uh, Riddling Throp. And they find that Mr. Uh, Cubit is dick be killed. And his wife uh, is uh, in critical condition with apparent self-inflicted head wound. Okay. The police initially suspect murder-suicide, but Holmes uncovers evidence indicating a third man had fired a shot from outside the building. Okay. Holmes explains to the police and Watson that he already knows who the murderer is and that he was once one of Mrs. Cubitt's very disagreeable associates. Okay. Holmes then writes a short message for Mr. Abe Slaney at the Elridge Farm and sends it off for delivery with one of Cubitt's stable boys. Abe, not too bright, he shows up, okay, and is arrested. He'd been lured to the Cuban home by Holmes' message, which was in the Dancing Men Code. The murderer had believed it was from Elsie. Once he believed, once, since he believed no one else could understand the Dancing Men Code. Okay. 
Holmes explains, what one man can invent, another man can discover. Okay. Holmes goes on, he says, explains, he had recognized the characters as likely being a simple ornamental and substitution cipher. It's got to be a substitution cipher. It can't be anything else. Okay. Uh, he looks at the first message, and he makes a good guess. He says, well, look, this, mess, this little character, the guy with his splayed legs and splayed arms, right side up, that's probably E. And he says, look at this. Oh, how fortunate for the plot. The, the man apparently puts a flag at the word endings. What nonsense, okay? But you know, we gotta have that or Holmes can't, can't function, trust me, okay? Uh, so this is, this is what he's got, okay? This is okay. Uh, Holmes explains that Elsie's, that Elsie's response message, R1, did not contain a flag and that the second and fourth letters were E. Based on this, Holmes assumes there's only one reasonable word, never. I went into my database and I found 197 words that had E for the, five letter words that had E for the second and fourth. But Holmes knew it was never. Okay, so he gets that. Uh, the third message now provides this. Blah, blah. What could this be, he says. Starts and ends in an E. Maybe it's Elsie's name. How fortunate. You know, they're, they're addressing one another. So he says, ah, I bet you that's Elsie. Sure enough. And, of course, you got a three-letter word with an E at the end. It can only be one word. Come. Come, Elsie. Okay. Okay. Well, he's got all this. He takes the, the initial message and starts plugging in letters, and he gets this. What word do you think that one is? Star E-R-E. -E. What's that? Here. Here. Okay. How about this? It could be an I. It could be an A, right? It shows up in one, two, uh, three places. So if you look at it's I'm, this would be I star E. There's no such word. So it's probably A M here, A star E, and there's S O L A N E, slain, kind of a name. So he says M here, blank slain. He says, this is obviously Abe Slaney, okay? Old Abe Slaney, of course, he doesn't know him from a hole in the wall. But, you know, the obvious vacancies become Abe Slaney. So M here, Abe Slaney. Okay. This message two plugs in this. It's got A star. What, this is probably what? Probably at. Notice the upside down man. This is critical for a later mystery. Okay. Uh, that's the T. At, he says, it's got to be all ridges. And so there you go. Poof. What a masterful cryptanalysis by the Holmes. Holmes knows the message author, Abe Slaney, and where he's staying, all ridges. When the last message arrives, he quickly decrypts it and realizes the threatening nature. It says something like, uh, it says, uh, Elsie, prepare to meet thy God, or something like that when you decrypt it, okay? Allows him to easily apprehend the murderer, okay? I call Bosch, okay? Uh, a moderate length story, advantage, good, takes about an hour to read. Exciting topic, detectives and murder. What more could you want? Maybe, you know, disadvantages. Ciphertext amounts to approximately 60 characters. Shorter than a typical crypto quip, okay? Uh, except for the fact that it hit the, the guy had the uh, uh, flags in the hand so you get the word separations, this would have been probably undoable. Thank goodness the criminals were stupid enough to put flags in there, okay? You know, my reaction is if you're going to do that, why don't you just put spaces in there, okay? Why, why, don't you, why are you getting clever with the, with the flags? With the, the, the guy you're sending the message to, he could probably figure out where the word divisions are. He knows the cipher. Holmes needs the, the only person who needs the, the flags is Holmes, okay? Okay, evaluation, a well-loved story of this disappointment when viewed through the eyes of a cryptanalyst. This thing is nonsense. I mean, I, I, right when I was a kid, I loved it. I go back, I go, oh, this thing's terrible. You know, it's terrible. Don't believe a word of it. Now, one thing I would tell you, let's have a, a little silly story. The T there, the upside down guy, there was a geocache in Massachusetts called Bring Your Code Book. Okay? It had a bunch of dancing men in it. 
Well, my, my, my buddy and I, uh, uh, from South Berwick, uh, Ray Wilkinson, uh, we, we, uh, we decrypted this, th this message. It gave us the Latin long to go to. Well, we get out into the woods. It's snow is like up to here. You know, it's like, you know, we're stupid, you know. We're geocaching, we're hanging out in the snow, you know. So we go crawl a half a mile out into the forest, okay. We get there, we're looking around, and we find this little film canister. We open it up, and what's in there? Another coded message. I was supposed to bring my code book, but I didn't. So we're standing in the snow, and we're thinking, we're going to have to walk back a half a mile to the car. And I said, hold up. I've been an ACA trail guide. I think we can do this. I found the T. There's the only thing I remembered was the T. From the T, I could find a three, because there was two, you know, just from the pattern, the double E. And from that, we managed to, in, tw in about 10 minutes, decrypt this message while we're standing in knee-deep snow. And, and thank God, we, we're writing this and ah, on a little map we had. And we were going, we get it done, yay. We went and we found the cache. Otherwise, we would have gone all the way back to the uh, car, decrypted it very quickly, and then walked back into the woods in another direction. It was, so that's a, a little, this is quite a common uh, cipher to use for geocaches. I've done at least three of them. Anyway, the treasure of Abbott Thomas. This is a great one. M.R. James. Anybody read M.R. James? Ah, oh, what a bunch of heathens. Come on. Somebody, this guy's a Mr. Ghost Story. This is guy, it's, it, he's, he's, he does real good ghost stories. I bet you you've seen some of his movies. Anybody ever seen The Night of the Demon? Everybody looks at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's, one of, that's a 50s, it's a great 50s uh, uh, t as thriller. Based on the James book? That's, yeah. That is, it's based on an M.R. James a story, uh, Casting the Ruins. Anyway, Treasure of Abbott Thomas, and it involves stained glass windows. Okay, there'll be something with stained glass windows, so I put this here, stained glass window. Okay, here he is, Montague Rhodes James, born 1862, good in stone, Kent, England. Look, those names are just great. We, we got to trash the ones we got. We got Alec Goodenstone. Maybe we can call Portland, London or something. I don't know. Attends Eaton, reads the classics at King's College, Cambridge. Point of fellow of King's College. He was a uh, historian of the medieval times, medieval ages. They were called antiquaries back then. So he's a historian. Provost of King's College, 1905, 1918. He had to hold, he had to hold Cambridge uh, together during uh, World War I. Uh, with, with all these people, boys were go, all these people he knew were going out and getting killed on the Western Front. Uh, Vice Chancellor of Cambridge from 1913 to 1915, appointed Provost of Eton, and Elder Paul yields at that post till his death in, in 1936. Best remembered for his ghost stories, written to be read aloud to friends on Christmas Eve. Uh, stories like uh, a, a Warning to the Curious, things like that. They're, they're really good. Uh, I, I recommend them highly. Died 1836. 1936, excuse me. Good looking guy. Uh, story starts with a Mr. Somerton who's an antiquary. I wonder who he's standing in for. Okay, just guessing. Translating a Latin text. This is great. There's a whole paragraph of London, right, of Latin, right in the up in front, concerning the legend of a hidden treasure by a 15th century monk. It reads Up to the present day, there's much gossip among the canons about a certain hidden treasure of this Abbot Thomas, for which those of Steinfeld have often made search. He was often asked where it was and always answered with a laugh. Jo Job, John, and Zechariah will tell you, will tell either you or your successors. Somerton realizes, yeah, but a little bit of a coincidence, that there, he's seen a stained glass window of German origin, which is, features the odd trio of Job, uh, St. John, and St. Zechariah. It's located in a private chapel of an English family. He visits, he visits the chapel and soon confirms that the window was originally commissioned by Abbot Thomas. Okay, uh, quick question. Who the heck is Zachariah? Anybody know? Yes, ma'am. Father of uh, John the Baptist. That is correct. That's correct. I had to look it up. I, I did not recognize the name. Zachariah is the father of John the Baptist. Uh, the, uh, the, her, his wife was uh, related somehow to uh, Mary. Okay, she, so... Uh, that's, that's interesting. Okay. 
The stained glass window has got three figures in it, Job, John, and Zechariah. Job has a scroll in the left hand, and he, with his right hand, uh, extended one finger upwards like this. Okay. John holds an inscribed book, again, something's got uh, text in it. With his right hand, he blesses us all with two fingers. Two fingers. Zechariah has a scroll also. It's also got writing on it. His hand extends upward as Job, but with three fingers pointed upwards. Three fingers. Each figure holds an inscribed scroll with passages in Latin. These passages are altered texts from the Bible. Job says, there is a place for the gold where it is hidden. John writes, they have on their vestitures a writing which no man knoweth. And Zechariah says, upon one stone are seven eyes. Wow, this is getting neat, huh? Based on Job's inscription, Somerton says, I think a uh, sure the location of the Abbot Thomas treasure is hidden on the stained glass window. The second thing says, hey, there's writing on their vestitures. It's hidden on their clothing. Well, he takes a good look, and he notices a little investigation that covers inscriptions under the black paint bordering the saint's clothing. There's actual writers written under it. And being, you know... A complete maniac, he goes and he scrapes off all the paint. Okay, now actually he gets permission from the owner. Shows it to the owner, the owner says, oh, that's interesting. What? And he gets this. A bunch of uh, gibberish, okay? Under, and then under John, he gets this. And Zechariah, he gets this. And notice, ah, some, some, uh, you know, Periods and stuff like somebody it was concluding the, uh, including the uh, parentheses and all that good stuff. Okay, so what kind of uh, cipher might this be? And it's got the the periods included. It's a tr it's probably a transposition cipher. She's absolutely right. She knows one answer. She just keeps it. Oh, oh, oh. Anyway, ah, it must be a transposition. Absolutely, that's correct. Anyway, Summerson states. I realized almost at once. I was dealing with a cipher or cryptogram, and I reflected it was likely to be of a pretty simple kind, considering the early date. So questions. Given it's composed by a 15th century monk, what kind of cipher is it? The young lady's already told us correctly. It's a transposition cipher. What language might the plain text be in? This is by a 15th century monk. It's probably Latin, right? Well, how would you go about analyzing it? It's a little bit more difficult. These are the transposition ciphers tell you, once you realize your transposition ciphers, there isn't a lot to analyze. You've got to start transposing it. Are there any potential clues from the stained glass windows? Okay. Yes, there are. It might be useful. Summerton realized that each figure in the window has a different number of fingers raised. One, two, three. He suspects that this is a transposition cipher and determines to try to use the one, two, three sequence in his first passage through. So he takes the, the, this stuff, he takes the first letter, skips a letter, then he's got the second letter, then he skips two letters, gets the third letter, skips three letters, gets another letter, and then does one, two, three again. And notice, he's got des, decim milla, milia. So he's, he's getting... He's getting uh, Latin there. So he, he feels pretty good. So he's got it. It's divided up the text. He gets Decimilia ori reposata sunt in putio in, and then a partial word, AT. Okay. That means 10,000 of gold are laid up in a well in, followed by the partial word, AT. It's in Latin. Ha! Ah! Okay. What would you do now with the rest of the letters? What would you do with the rest of the letters? Try the same thing. One, two, three. It's the first guess. It doesn't work. But he takes a look at it. And this is where you try to figure out what the probable words are. Okay. It says a well in A-T. And he knows, his, he knows his Latin really well because he's an antiquary. Okay. He thinks in Latin. Okay. He says, aha, it's probably a well in the court, an atrio. And he looks at this, and sure enough, if he skips every other letter, he gets R I O. And he gets Damus, that's V's are the U's. Damus, Abba, Abataya, uh, Lis, Lis, uh, something, blah, 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 blah. 
Okay. He's got, you know, he, he, he starts to get English and he gets, re, he gets the reading. Uh, Rio Domus Abatalis de Steinfeld a mi Tama Toma qui posi costem custodem super ea gari a qui latouche. Is that Latin? That's French. Okay. Ah. So it's, it's a double a Xeno here. The entire message reads that. Translated, 10,000 of gold are laid up in the well in the court of the abbot's house of Steinfeld by me, Thomas, who have set a guardian over them. Okay. Gari aqui latouche. You don't want to mess with it. Now, I don't know about you, but he's a guardian. He tells him not to mess with it. What are you going to go do? Just go mess with it. He ends up finding the, the, the old uh, abbey. He gets down to the well. The well actually has stairs going down. He goes down. He finds a stair, uh, uh, actually a block on a wall near the stairs that has seven eyes on it. He says, aha, I'm going to mess with it. He pulls it out. About the same time, they see the ghost of Abbot Thomas giving him, laughing at them. And he goes and he grabs the bag of gold. And the giant toad that's behind it sends out its tongue and grabs onto him. Now he get away. They get up. They get back to their hotel. And they know that they're being watched by, by they can't see, you know, everything's wrong around them. You know, they're being watched by, you know, persons or things unknown. They end up getting another Englishman to put the gold back. Okay. That's, uh, it's, a, it's a good story. Uh, well, what, what isn't great about it? I mean, it's got a treasure and a monster guardian toad. What more could you want? Maybe pirates. Okay, modern length story takes less than an hour to read. Exciting topic, treasure and monster guardian toad. Find an introduction solution of route transmission ciphers. It's kind of an odd one, but hey. Upfront, large upfront paragraph in Latin may allow a tie-in with a Latin class. You can assign the Latin to the students to decode, decrypt, or de whatever they do, translate it, okay, uh, as a homework assignment. That's the belt plus and disadvantages. A large upfront paragraph in Latin may turn off mere pedestrian students, okay. Evaluation, good read and very reasonable. Good read. I, I like uh, M.R. James. Okay, this is my favorite story. The other one I like is uh, a Warning the Curious. He does a good job. Ghost Stories of an Antiquary. Good, good, good read. Last but not least, Calloway's Code by O. Henry. What kind of a name? What kind of a person would name his kid O? Yeah. Oh, 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 it was epic or whatever that stupid commercial is. 1906. Okay, and it involves the Russo-Japanese War, hence this triptych from Japan. Okay, most, most the Japanese are mostly bayoneting the Russians, and there's a little Russian, the Russians killing anybody. It's pretty sad. Ah, well, anyway, there he is. Oh, Henry William Sidney Porter, born 1862, Greensboro, North Carolina. 1882 moves to Texas for health reasons. Works as a pharmacist, journalist, and begins writing as a sideline. 1891. He's working at the First National Bank of Austin as a teller and bookkeeper. 1894, accused of uh, embezzlement. 1896, indicted. He flees to Honduras, but returns a year later. Convicted February 1898, sentenced to five years in prison, begins to seriously write while in an Ohio penitentiary. Oh, Henry. Okay. Following his release from prison, he moves to New York City, dies there in 1910. Okay, I don't know. I, I got to admit, I was never, I, maybe it was read one of his stories at some time, but uh, I don't remember much of his stuff. Okay. The story states that H.B. Calloway has been sent as a special correspondent to the Russo-Japanese War by his, his newspaper, the New York Enterprise, a real sounding but imaginary paper. Calloway is attached to the Japanese First Army in Manchuria with a large group of correspondents. He is present for the run-up to the Battle of the Yalu River, okay, a real battle, and is prevented from providing his newspaper with meaningful dispatches by the Japanese who are censoring all the telegraphic messages. Despite this, Calloway manages to furnish the Enterprise with the biggest beat of the war. That the paper exclusively publishes the news of the attack on the Russian lines. The same day it was, ha it was made, no other paper prints a word about it for two days, except the new a London paper whose account is incorrect. Calloway's feat was accomplished by a dispatch passed by the Japanese censor. 
Censor believes it's an apparent jumble of words, complaining of the dearth of news and petitioning for more expense money. Enterprise staff is puzzled by the meaning of this badge. They got no idea what it means. When it arrives, no one can decrypt it until it's shown to a young reporter by the name of Vessi. Vessi is able to read it in less than 15 minutes. And here it is. Foregone, preconcerted, rash, witching goes, muffled rumor, mind dark, silent, unfortunate, Richmond, existing, great, hotly, brute, select, mooted, powerless, beggars, ye angel, incontrovertible. What do you think? What kind of cipher is this? What's that? It's some kind of concealment cipher, right? He's trying, he's not supposed to be communicating, so we're going to, you're not going to give him, here, here's my secret message. Okay, these might be code words. These might be words if he had a code book, but the paper doesn't have the other code. Doesn't have a code book, so it, it, we can roll out a code. This is probably some kind of concealment cipher. And so, what kind of is it? Code, code cipher. It's and what's the difference? If it's a cipher, what's it likely to be? And we do it. Say it's a. It's a uh, it is probably a concealment cipher. It's simple English, explains Vessi. I've been reporting on the Enterprise long enough to know it by heart. Old Calloway gives us the Q word, and we use the word that naturally follows it, as we use them in the paper. Read it over, and you'll see how pat they drop into their places. Now, here's the message he intended. The message is a concealment cipher, not a code. Foregone, foregone, the word is conclusion. Preconcerted arrangement. Rash act, witching, hour of midnight. Goes was without saying, muffled report, rumor hath it, mine host, and it goes on and on and on. Richmond in the field, I think, is the only one here that you don't see much of anymore. Brute force, mooted, moot, moot question, beggar's description, he's got all of it there. So the, here's what they what it said. You look at this, conclusion, arrangement, act, at the, will be at the hour of midnight without saying, report, hath it, the host is horse, with majority of pedestrians, i.e. infantry, in the, in the field, conditions gray are, are white, meaning it's snowing. Way contested force is few. So the, the way contesting uh, the, the, the Russian force is small. Muted qu question, times, description, correspondent unawares of the facts. In other words, the, 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 the uh, Times guy has got it wrong. Con Concluded uh, arrangement to act at the hour of midnight without saying blah, 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 blah. Advantage, a short story. It takes you less than 10 minutes to read. It's two pages long. Okay? An excellent example of a concealment cipher. Disadvantages, mundane topic. It's fake news. Okay, evaluation. It's a pretty good story. I liked it. And that's why I'm so glad we have a few additional resources here for anybody who might be thinking of a list of cryptology-related fiction uh, done by... Uh, Mr. Dooley is published in Cryptologia. There's the link to it. It's got uh, five, six hundred examples of, of stories that have crypto cryptanalysis in them. Uh, potential additional classic stories. 800 Leagues on the Amazon by Jules Verne. Oh, it's awful. The, the cipher comes at the end, and it's a, it's a Gronsfeld cipher. And the guy obviously understood what it was, but he's, he keeps guessing at the key. No, you don't guess at the key. He had a probable word. You crib drag it. And I kept screaming as I was listening to this. Drag the crib, you idiot. But he wasn't listening, okay? Drag the crib. Much better. Uh, the Mayor's Wife by Anna Catherine Green. Anybody ever read of her, read her stuff? She, uh, 1907, she is uh, considered to be like one of the founders of modern uh, detective fiction. Yeah, she's got some. Uh, she's got both male and female detectives. In this case, Miss Saunders is her detective. Uh, good female uh, character. Companion of the mayor's wife helps capture the black mayor by solving several pig pen variant cipher messages. Everybody aware of pig pen? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's a uh, old cipher based on uh, tic tac toe and uh, X's and stuff. It's Okay, that's all I got. Okay, again, take out this book while you got a chance. Good. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's probably not in classical literature. What's that? Uh, my question relates to at what point do crypto uh, machines 
come into the literature? Uh, coding machines. Um, in, in reality, they came. They they they. Uh, they got to start after World War One. By the by, the end of by the beginning of World War Two, all the major powers were using machine encryption. Okay, uh, I can't off the top of my head think of a story that revolves around something like that. Obviously, there's a few things out there like uh, the Cryptonomicon that I think involve uh, Enigma machines and things like that. But I don't know much about exactly what. They, 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 I don't. I didn't. I never read that. Come on. I couldn't have been this thorough, or I couldn't have drugged you this badly. <laughs> Give me your money. Your money. What? <laughs> and no other questions? Other than that, uh, have a good evening, guys. Okay. And it only took me an hour and 20 minutes. I always go an hour and 20 minutes. I always go over.